Thanks, Jamie. Hi, everyone. Um, fully expected Emma to be here, and I'm, so, I'm, so I'm missing one of my partners in, in science and crime on this issue. So I want to extend her apologies. She really, really, really wanted to be here, but you will be hearing from her a little bit later. Um, we've got, is that happening now? Okay. Sorry. You're hearing from her now. Can everyone hear me? I don't have any feedback, so I'm just going to start talking and we'll see how we go. Um, so, hello everyone. I hope you're all having a really wonderful time in Denver. I am so sorry I couldn't join. I was looking forward to it so much, to meeting new people and catching up again with partners in crime like Ross. Um, yeah, I've got a back injury, it stopped me flying, um, and the only thing I can say is, if it happens to you, don't go back to weightlifting until your physio says it's okay. Um, so, last year in Las Vegas, I talked to you about biology, about being male, about what happens to a male body when it loses testosterone, and of course, what that means for sport. Those males, trans women, don't get shorter, they lose a bit of muscle, they gain a bit of fat, they lose a bit of CV capacity. And nothing has happened since Vegas to change that scientific consensus. And in fact, a couple of new studies only add to that consensus. Even when trans women have been suppressing testosterone for maybe 14 years, their skeleton resolutely refuses to shrink their muscle mass and CV capacity is still significantly higher than in females. So, from my point of view, the biology is settled. We don't see anything coming in the future that will alter this increasingly clear picture that trans women retain male advantage as a result of their male development, as a result of their male sex, and sex matters in sport. Never quick to desert a clearly sinking ship, the arguments against this settled biology have ramped up. We are seeing outright dishonest manipulations around statistics. Pound for pound, trans women match females uh, from people who are ignoring that trans women have got a lot more pounds and that being bigger is precisely the kind of male advantage that is excluded from the female category. The spectre of Michael Phelps still looms, <laughs> um, with many people, including scientists um, and, and philosophers, still unable to understand the difference between the types of advantage that require categories and the types of advantage that separate three athletes on a podium. Happily, sports federations are starting to cut through this. Many, including the big names, are taking a scientific approach. It is necessary to have evidence that male advantage is lost. They are falling, if not quite like dominoes, but they are falling. And they are, yay, um, doing so, citing Hilton and Lumberg in their policies and reviews. But while I and Tommy and Ross have had a hand in settling the biology. This has been and remains a joint effort. Academics have a role. Here is a paper. Here are some numbers. <laughs> Here are some definitions of fairness. But it is all of us who have shoved this pendulum hard back. It is you who have leafleted and shouted through megaphones, who have written endless letters, court papers, who have written books, who have made YouTube videos and written crazy songs, who've met with representatives, who have terrorized sports federations and demanded to be heard. And many of you there are the most significant voices of all, athletes, female athletes, current and former, who have seen harm and who have been harmed 
by unfair and irrational policies from the very top of sports and who I've been honoured to help out by talking a lot about testicles. Um, so on that, <laughs> I'll hand you back to Ross. I think I'm going to go and watch the rest of this lying down on my couch. <laughs> Thank you, Emma. Thank you so much. Thanks, Kim. Thanks, tech team, for making that happen. And thanks, Emma, for, for doing that. And we'll see you later when the panel discussion happens. So I'll just wait for my slides. But while I do that, I just wanted to reflect. Yesterday, sat in the back quietly listening and watching. And a couple of things struck me, and then a couple more things this morning. The one is that very few people got up here and said that they want to be in this discussion and in this fight. We heard, we heard from an aspirate dentist who's put root canals on hold. We heard from, we've heard from a journalist who happily left The Economist. We heard from an evolutionary biologist who less happily left an institution, but has taken up a, a struggle for something that matters a great deal. And I'm a physiologist, and I didn't do a PhD to try and persuade people that male advantage is real and simply taking testosterone away is the way to create, to create fairness. And so I'm, I'm similar to the people you heard about yesterday. And so in developing the slides that I wanted to share with you today, which um, hopefully are on the way, yes? I wanted to frame this and also say that when Kim, Kim said, will you come and talk about the biology? You know, we did this, Emma and I, last year in Las Vegas. And it's, this, it's the same stuff. And I said to Kim, but there's not really anything new that's happening. Is this uh, able to advance? Yeah, the yeah, I'm trying. Give us a second here, Ross. Okay. Where was I? I said, I said, Kim, there's not, there's not really anything new. This is just going to be going back to the same. It's like watching a rerun. And and Emma's actually pointed that out to you as well, is that there's really not much has happened on the science side. There's been tremendous progress from some of the sports federations, but that's not because they've seen new science in the last 12 months. That's because they've been forced to look at the science that was on the table the whole time. And why have they been forced to look at that? Is because they've been compelled to by the voices of women like yourselves who've asked them and insisted that they pay attention to it. So what I would very much like for this to become this conference, I said to Kim, this is the last time I want to do this talk. <laughs> I want to do this talk one more, one more time. And then from then on, the next time we do it, we want to talk about the actual icons in women's sport, the athletes themselves. Tomorrow, the Tour de France farm starts in, in Clermont in France. The men's race finishes and the women's race starts. I'd far rather be spending my physiological time and expertise explaining to you about cycling performance even talk about doping ahead of the stuff we had to talk about here. The Women's World Cup, last night we had some drinks and dinner in the yard house and we watched the US kick off their World Cup defense. Maybe in the next few weeks, the uh, women's title, that seems to potentially be working. Maybe in the next few weeks, we can celebrate the actual on-field performances instead of discussing who shouldn't and should be on that field. That would be a real privilege to come back one day and be able to talk to you about that side of the physiology as opposed to this. But nevertheless, this is where we are. So this is a presentation in celebration of biological reality and sporting icons, who I hope that we'll one day be able to talk about a little bit more, like Demi Vollering on the left, like the English lionesses, who perhaps will dethrone the US in New Zealand in a few weeks' time. Maybe not. I'm not from England, by the way. We have a team in the, in the tournament also, but we have no chance of dethroning anyone. And so this is... There we go. Is not working as smoothly as I'd hoped. So what I wanted to do was to talk to you a little bit, looking back through the lens of the scientific conversation over the last four years to where we are today and then to, to what might happen next. And the journey starts in 2019, which is when all, all Olympic sports were pretty much under the existing IOC guideline. And Linda yesterday shared with you how that guideline had existed. This was the 2015 policy at the time. And basically, it amounted to testosterone suppression. And so, in hindsight, most of you would not have known what was happening behind the closed doors of the IOC 
as they were setting up those policies and creating these, these eligibility requirements into women's sport. And the concept at the time, the belief system at the time, was testosterone suppression works. And looking in hindsight now, this was very much like the dark ages. It was happening with no light on it. And slowly but surely, and you've heard from a couple of people, a door was being pushed open to let a little bit of light into that conversation. And at this point, it's worth acknowledging, powerlifting were the first sport that I saw stand up and say, we need a policy that keeps male advantage out of women's sport. No good deed going unpunished, powerlifting now in a big lawsuit. And so we knew potentially that that would happen. But they were the first. And so hat tip to powerlifting, sitting in the back right of the room for that. What, what has happened and started to happen was this emerging light. Now, for myself, I was in the darkness then. I hadn't gotten involved in this issue. But being from South Africa, the issue that had been in the headlines was the Castor Semenya DSD one, which has become, well, at the time, from 2009 to 2019, became the main area in which I was involved in the concept of male advantage in women's sport, and which has which has undermined and detracted from the trans conversation and continues to do, and perhaps we'll discuss that a little bit later on when we have the panel discussion. What happened next was we went into 2020, and that was kind of like my first foray into the trans issue in sport. And I was, as you've heard in the introduction, um, working with World Rugby on research. My main focus is concussion prevention and injury prevention and management in the sport. But World Rugby had just come into the Olympic family. Our first Olympics were in 2016. And we had begun to receive emails and calls from concerned parents and referees and some players about what we were doing around trans women who were playing women's rugby. And so we said, all right, we need to, we need to organize a meeting. And that meeting was held in February 2020. We got it in just in time before the world sort of shut down. And this is a photograph of all the delegates who are at that meeting. Sorry, the click is not working as smoothly as I'd hoped. You'll see there, for instance, Emma's in that photograph. John Pike, who you've just heard from. We, we brought together a group of people, and I wanted to talk about the concept behind this meeting, because I think it was an important element of the scientific process, was how it was brought about. The guiding principle of that meeting was to hear all arguments from all sides without prejudice. Now, yesterday Helen spoke in response to a question about what it is that we need to ensure exists, and she spoke about how you need a culture. Rugby, maybe serendipitously, had created a culture that was encapsulated by something we reminded ourselves very often of, and that was evidence, not emotion. And that came about because, as you may know from your American football, there's a lot of pressure on contact sports around concussion and the later in life consequences. And rugby found itself squarely in the firing line for that issue. And then when we had to confront this one, we said, well, the same principle is true. We need evidence, not emotion. We, we understood that there's a ton of emotion around this issue, but what does the evidence actually say? And then we said, well, the best way to get that out is to bring a group of people who are going to share with us that evidence, not just from the world of science, but from the legal realm, the medical realm, the ethical realm, and so forth. And so it's, let's hear what you have to say, and then whatever we decide. Because I think everyone knew, even then, that you were going to ultimately make a choice, because it's obviously a colliding rights issue. And whether you can reconcile those colliding rights or not was the question. So we said, let's hear from everyone, and then we can be informed and know what we were doing and why we were choosing to do it. And so it was set up... Emma was one, as, as you've just seen in the photograph, one of the people who was invited. Uh, she represented science and medicine. We had Tommy Lundberg from Sweden. Uh, Joanna Harper presented at that. We had legal experts. We had a barrister. We had a human rights lawyer. We had ethical experts. John Pike was there for that reason. We had representation from the affected groups. Now, obviously, you can imagine very quickly, it split into two sides. There was the groups arguing for female-only sports, and then there were those who were arguing for trans women inclusion. And we set it up by design to function kind of like a court case where we, used, where we could hear from two opposing expert witnesses on our subject, science or medicine, whatever. And then the idea was to interrogate those questions and to try and ask them to respond to one another. So let's hear what happens when scientists debate it among themselves and we could be the onlookers watching a tennis match, in effect, about the scientific evidence. 
let's watch the tennis match between the legal experts, one arguing for safety issues, one arguing for human rights issues. Let's hear from legal experts giving insights on science and vice versa. So it was meant, it was constructed as quite a dynamic engagement. And the reason I'm saying that is because I know that a lot of sports who have as yet not committed to a policy might be thinking about this. I think this was a really important thing for us to have done because it shone a light on el every element of the argument from multiple directions. Without that, you can only ever consider one argument at a time in isolation. And I don't think that we would have arrived at the understanding and the position that we did as a consequence. I'll tell you what the outcome of, the, the most profound outcome of that was in a moment. So let's just park that for now. Then the next thing that happened, if this eventually moves on, there we go, is the, the, the second principle behind that was transparency. We said to every single person that nothing in support of your position should be said if you're not happy to say it for everyone to hear. There's no reason, and we've seen subsequently documents produced without authors, people not willing to put their names to arguments. That's not good enough in a debate like this. If you're, can't, if you're not willing to say something and put it in publicly and stand behind it, then it's not really worth putting out there. That's how science works. It has to be transparent. And so every presentation was made on, available online. You can still find them now. We conducted a survey in the women's game and shared those results. What we couldn't get was permission for the video. We wanted to actually film every presentation and make it available. Couldn't happen, unfortunately, and we couldn't get agreement to have the media present. <laughs> Part of me wanted to just have this thing as a massive public debate with media in attendance and attendance and stream it live and so on, but people were reluctant to do that. But nevertheless, we managed to get some things done. And the main outcome is, and this is where I'm going to start getting into some data, is that it was recognized that male advantage was real and that it was significant. It can be divided and assessed in any number of ways, and I'm going to get into some of those. And most importantly, that when testosterone levels are suppressed, there is only limited reduction or removal of those male advantages. And here we are half a dozen such examples. So the way to read that is that the, the, the total length of the bar was the initial male advantage, 20 to 40 percent, for instance, in mass, lean mass, mass and volume strength. And then the dark blue is how much you could reverse it. And so unless, the principle being that unless this dark blue, this reversal runs all the way back to zero, there's residual male advantage. Now, we are a sport that has significant player welfare concerns. Players, player welfare is the number one priority. It's become almost a joke <laughs> within world rugby because it gets said so often, it's become a cliche. But that's because it's true. And so that what then happened was, and, and this was maybe one of the key turning points, is that John spoke at that um, meeting and he introduced the concept of lexical ordering to us. Do you remember this, John? Do you, do you have a microphone? Get, can someone get John a microphone, please? Because it's far better you hear it from the expert than from me. And, and so what we'd, what we'd realized is that as a sport, and everyone knew this, we had, we had various responsibilities. We had to put on a sport that was fair, safe, and inclusive. Now, the word inclusive is loaded because it, it became owned by one side, not the other. We'll get to that a little bit later. And so it was quite clear that there was going to be this tension between those three imperatives. And John introduced a concept that helped us think about how we ranked those. So John, you tell us what lexical ordering is. Okay, so lexical ordering is the sort of ordering you have in a dictionary. So you rank everything by, you rank the words by their first letter. Uh, so a all the words beginning with A come before all the words beginning with B, but then you rank aardvark before abacus. Uh, so you take the second criterion, the second kind of value, and you rank everything after the first value. I'm not explaining this terribly well. It's, it's in the paper. Um, it's a t t it derives from John Rawls, but it's, it's a bit like a decision tree. You do the first thing, then the second thing, then the third thing. So what I argued was, first of all, your obligation is to make rugby safe. Uh, so you wouldn't introduce a proposal that was fair but not safe. And of course, there's a question about you know, how safe and what people consent to and so on. Uh, but you, so rugby needs to be inclusive, but it needs to be inclusive as the third kind of variable, the third value, 
after we've ensured that it's safe and fair. Thank you. So, and, and, and it's difficult to, to put you in the frame of what it was like to hear that expressed because you can imagine, we, we knew that we'd have to take this to a board and the executives and the councils and all the decision makers and then all the member unions of World Rugby around the world and we'd have to say to them, look, this is why we've done what we've done and how we've chosen it. And as I just sort of semi-joked about, we, we have very much prioritized player welfare. Every meeting that happens at World Rugby at the executive or the board level starts with a session on player welfare and myself and the chief medical officer go in first. It's the first item on the agenda. So for us to make the position to say that player welfare is the number one responsibility, and therefore if in this debate we have to think about how we order and rank priorities instead of balancing them, the, the, well, it's not the opportunity, it's the obligation to put safety first was, was obvious. And so, and so we spent, so we spent a couple of days hearing from the experts and we said, well, the IOC has said the following, and this was from that IOC document at the time. This was what was in play. And you'll get an example of this weird tension and this irreconcilable balance that, was, that was people were trying to, trying to find. Um, struggling with the remote here, sorry. So it is necessary to ensure insofar as possible that trans athletes are not excluded from the opportunity to participate in sporting competition. That was the IOC's words. In the same document, the overriding sporting objective is and remains the guarantee of fair competition. So those, those two things seem at odds with one another. And the, the bottom one seems to me to override the top one because it literally says the overriding sporting objective. So the ISC had given these, this very conflicted message, but when you start to put the two arguments, the scientific arguments for and against safety, inclusion, fairness up against one another, it becomes very clear. And it was very clear to us that we couldn't balance those two things. We had to choose and we had to start making uh, decisions around what we were going to prioritize. And given that there was no scientific evidence at all that you could remove male biological advantages, only evidence for retention, even with its limitations. No one was pretending that that evidence was perfect or complete, but there were limitations. didn't make a difference to the concept or the suggestion then the conclusion was that we could not do anything but continue with a safety prioritization. Now, that's where we ended, and I'm going to come back to that because our part of what we had then committed to do was review it in three years' time, and that comes up now in October. So we will sit down in October and have a discussion again, and I want to share, I'll, when I end this presentation, I'll tell you what we're going to consider at that point. But why does this tension exist in the first place? Now, this is the bit where I start telling you the obvious, because you all know this. I recognized it yesterday. You know this. And this is the bit where, you, in your gut, it's so obvious, yet it still had to be presented and explained. If we take one of the sports where the differences between males and females is the smallest, we see a range of performance differences between 9.5% and the marathons around 10%. On average, men's and women's running performances differ by about 12%. Now, there's a number of ways that you can frame this. This is a slide from one of Emma Hilton's presentations, which shows one argument or one illustration of it. Sorry, just going to head back there. So there on the left is Florence Griffith Joyner, who is the world record holder in the women's 100. That record has stood for an incredibly long time, multiple generations of athletes. But at the same time, there are 3,500 males who are faster than that performance including a 15-year-old male who is much faster than that. That's 10.49. The, male, the 15 year old record is 10.20. That's this athlete here. And 157 have gone sub-10. On the right, yesterday you were introduced to one of the uh, queens or princesses, goddesses of Jamaica. Here's another one of them, Elaine thompson Hera. 1,642 males faster than her in the year that she won that Olympic title. That includes masters, juniors, and so forth. So there's a number of ways that we can say, well, look, this is the implication of male performance advantage. You all know those. There's a site boys versus women, which documents a number of other statistics. And it makes for a powerful argument for how large this advantage actually is. So, we know that physiology drives performance. Tommy Lindberg, the aforementioned researcher from Sweden, earlier this week produced the following. It's a summary of differences in strength between males and females for different 
muscles or joints. Sorry. <laughs> so from the ankles all the way to the shoulders, you can see that there's a difference here, and this is the scale, maps the percentage differences. So from about 40% at the, at the neck flexors, then you get ankle plantar flexion, dorsiflexion, you move through leg press and so forth, all the way to the upper body where those strength differences are the largest. And so these are the strength, the muscle strength differences, and not surprisingly, they have significant performance implications, for example, in weightlifting, where even when matched, and this is an important point because it comes up regularly in the attempts to rebut male advantage, even when matched for mass and height, males outperform females. So, 55 kilogram weight class, the men's combined world record is 294, which is 30% higher than that for women. In the 69 kilogram class, it's around 30.1% higher than for women. And then in the upper or the open category, the heavyweight category, it's larger because now you have a mass difference over and above the physiological strength difference per kilogram. So, these are profound differences. Now, this, the reason I that bring this up, and this is so important, is because there have been attempts, and these are the more recent developments, Emma alluded to them, to try and argue against male advantage by adjusting for mass. And one of those arguments was made in a document that was produced by an organization called e Alliance on behalf of the Canadian Center for Ethics in Sport. That paper has been, well, a, a, a review article critiquing it has been written, I think Kathy Devine was the first author, is that right John? Or was it Miroslav, was it Kathy? If you look for Devine et al, there's an article called Ideology Trump Science, in which they go through this more systematically than I will in this presentation, but I did want to pick up one or two high level points about this. So the, 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 the document, this is, this is the nameless one, I, don't, I still don't know which scientists were responsible for producing it. But it, it put out a number of different concepts and ideas, one of which is shown here very shortly. Um, I think some tech issues. Is there, is there potentially another one of these available? Is this it? Okay. One, one of the arguments that was made is that bodies are systems, and there is not one discrete biomarker that allows easy comparison of athletes' bodies to each other in terms of performance. Well, exactly. That's the whole point. So this was offered in rebuttal to the idea that testosterone, no one at this point, in 2019 when we were all in the dark room maybe, there was a lot of people debating testosterone, but we've moved on a considerable amount since then. And so this is kind of the point, is that male advantage is not one thing, it's everything, all at once. And so that was the first thing that they said. Now in, the, in that paper there was a whole section on the biomedical considerations and issues and it listed a couple of things, and I wanted to highlight those. Number one, biological data are severely flawed or limited and often methodologically flawed. I think it's true to say that the biological data are not perfect. There are limitations in studies because that's how studies are. There's no such thing as a perfect research study. I'm not sure I agree that they're severely limited, but we'll explore some of that in a moment. But the point, point number one underneath that is most studies do not adequately adjust for factors such as height or body mass. The questions I would ask is, if there was zero evidence at all, what would you do? If you were a decision maker in sports and there was nothing available to you and you suddenly found yourself receiving claims from people to enter into a category that existed and in theory you respected and protected, and there was no evidence in support of their claim, would you allow that until that evidence was provided, or would you say, no, let's wait for that evidence? Yesterday, Linda spoke to you about how in 2003 they made that decision based on one study. If that Canadian, if that CCS document is saying the, the, the date at the moment, in 2022, is severely limited and methodologically flawed, what do you reckon they made of that paper in 2003, or 50, it, was, it was later then, it was 15? It was far worse. But I would argue that the point was that they should not have acted on the absence of evidence. They should have said, let's get the evidence before we make a decision. And then the second point on this is that it's actually sleight of hand to try and argue for adjustment of factors because if you try and adjust for the reasons for male advantage, you can make male advantage disappear. This is a statistical technique that has been used by many different people. So if you'll allow me a diversion, you all fans and exercises and athletes and you regularly run and so forth, you, you know, right, that there is a straight line between regular exercise 
and longer and healthier life. This has been, you know it. You know it to be true. We even know why it exists. We know it exists because exercise causes things like weight loss, reduced blood pressure, improved blood glucose regulation, cholesterol, and not smoking, for instance. It's a, it's a co-behavior. Yet, the literature is full of papers, and you can go and find them. Here's one example back from 2012, which will tell you that there is no evidence that regular exercise and more exercise increases lifespan. So, for example, this was from Leah's study finds that running more than 25 miles a week, faster than 8 miles an hour, or for more than 5 days a week, has no benefit on mortality. And when you read, and this is a, this is a detour, but I'll, I'll come to why this is important. When you read how that study did that and found that, what you'll discover is they use a method called Cox... Let me just move on to it. They use Cox regression to quantify the association between running and mortality after adjusting for. So you see what they do is they say, let's do statistical adjustments and control for things that could confound this, such as age, sex, examination year, body mass index, current smoking, heavy alcohol drinking, hypertension, hypercholesterolemia, parental CVD, and levels of other physical activities. What these studies basically amount to is the following, is if we ignore the reasons exercise is healthier and reduces mortality, then more exercise isn't healthier and doesn't reduce mortality. <laughs> That's how illogical it is. That same, that same illogical approach is now being applied to male advantage by those in the CCS document who are arguing for controlling for male advantage. We know that male biology has sports performance differences. We know how they come about because of increased lean mass, because of increased total mass. The argument to control and correct and adjust for those things is to say, let's put a line through the things that make male biology real and then conclude that it doesn't exist. It's illogical. It's absurd, and it's a, as I say, it's a trick that's designed to make male advantage disappear. And the craziest thing of all is it doesn't even work, because even when you do it, male advantage still exists. And so this is a study, this is a study called Sex Segregation in Strength Sports. Do equal sized muscles express the same levels of strength between sexes? It was published earlier this year, and what they basically did was they went back in all the studies in their lab and they conclude the following. We, our results would suggest that segregation based on muscle mass or surrogates of muscle mass might not be appropriate classification. To, might, might not be an appropriate classification to create for comp to competition within strength sports. And what they basically found is that in about 85% of instances, even when you go so far as to say what's the literal size of the muscle, the, the thickness, the cross-sectional area of the muscle, males still have overwhelming performance advantages compared to females. So that's, that's that argument anyway, the idea that you're supposed to somehow correct. And yes, there are some sports where being heavier is a disadvantage. The Tour de France is one such example. But it doesn't necessarily follow that being the lightest is the advantage. There's a complex interplay between how much power you can produce absol in absolute terms and how much you produce in relative terms. And that's why Many professional cycling teams now use a compound score where it's both. It's relative and absolute. And so this notion that we should just simply take away by correcting statistically is, is not accurate, it's not ground in reality, and it's entirely unnecessary. But it's done to make it look like something doesn't exist that does. So ultimately what we're left with is a whole set of advantages. This is another one of Emma's slides. And you can look at these physical differences once again, you, and, and it all the way down to the bottom, which is punching power, rugby scrum force, sorry, there's punching power here, this is rugby scrum force. So there are performance differences, there are functional differences, and then there's the underlying or underpinning physiology that causes those. So that's, that should be the start point in any decision-making process around the science. Now, the next thing to look at is what happens when testosterone levels are lowered. But before we get onto that, Remember, and I'm going to come back to this graph a few times because it's quite important. Remember that no matter what variable you're looking at, the existence of male advantage doesn't imply complete separation between male and female. There are many athletes, female athletes, who are way, way better than most male athletes. Yesterday in Monaco, the women's mile world record was broken. 407.64, I think was the time. Most, I would venture to say 99% of men will never come close to running 407 for the mile. That doesn't tell you that there's no advantage. It just tells you 
that that female performance is absolutely exceptional. So I'm amplifying a little bit the separation between the sexes, but let's say that was mild performances. What you have is an exceptional female performance that is better than many, many, many male performances, most of them in fact, but there will be some that are not, right? So there's overlap which we must still respect, and that exists for height, for mass, for strength, for running speed, etc. An important concept to bear in mind. <laughs> and potentially the, the best example that I've seen of this was something that was shared at the Casta Semenya case in 2019 at the Court of Arbitration for Sport. It was produced by Dorian Coleman, or Lam Lamley Coleman, and what it shows is the 400 meter times from 2017 in males highlighted blue and then what I've highlighted here with these circles as the best performing females that year. So you can see that that's the, that's, that's the world record, right? And then you look at all these blue points, like light blue is adults and dark blue is juniors. And you will look at how many thousands of male performances are better than these best female performances in that same period, right? And so this is really important because it makes a couple of important points. When we consider male and female as one population with overlap, the best females are ranked thousands of places behind the best males. But remember, this graph doesn't stop here. That's 50 seconds. There's still, a, there's still six, four billion, three billion people to the right of those women. So they beat most males, but the best male difference compared to females is enormous. And that's why we have categories in the first place, right? Now, the thing about this, and we're working towards a hypothesis, is that the reverse, if a male enters women's sport, their ranking will improve significantly. That's logical. This male here, pick any dot, let's take this person here, ranked, I don't know, 6,500. If that person was allowed to race against females, even with the loss of a few percent, would still be ranked number one in that category. So that's an important hypothesis generating exercise that we'll get onto the implications of in a moment. But before that, let's consolidate that that is the very reason why women's sport exists. This is the biological basis for it. So, for instance, at the Olympic Games, we crown champions in two different categories. We have a men's triathlon champion and a women's triathlon champion. We have a men's greatest ever swimmer and we have a women's greatest ever swimmer. Those who don't respect and appreciate the biological reality of sex would have to conclude that the fact that these female champions are 10 to 14 percent slower than these male champions is a consequence of them being mediocre athletes. I can't see how you can avoid that conclusion. I would ask them, why do you then give the medals? What are you rewarding? So that it's, it's an illogical position that they have to occupy the moment you start to deny these biological realities. And in truth, I don't think that they are denying those realities. And, and I think John has made a very good point to say, they're arguing for male residual advantage, not against male advantage. But more, what you should be saying, I think, is that Duffy and, and Ledecky are equal to Blumenfeld and Phelps. They're worthy of the same recognition, the same reward for having the same physiology that, ma that makes exceptional triathletes and swimmers. But there's one thing that they don't have, right? There's one key difference, and that is a set of advantages that is uniquely available to males. And that's the point. That's why the that female category has to exist. So when we take the world's population and we say, all right, this is everyone competing together, we've long since recognized that categories are necessary to ensure that there can be inclusion of as many people as possible. Not exclusion, inclusion. Categories are inclusive by nature. So the world's population can be split for instance, into males and females. If it were not, and we rewarded only athletic ability in humans, this group would hardly be represented at all, if at all, in fact. What we then do, and we do this regularly, and I want to draw these analogies, is we say that males themselves can be split, for instance, in combat sports into middleweights and heavyweights. But then we do the same thing for females, right? We have, a, we have women's heavyweights, and we have women's middleweight competitions. And we would never entertain the idea of allowing these two boxes to cross one another. Because the, the male-female advantage is so enormous that we need a weight category within each one, not separate from each one, right? So you would never allow those boxes to exist and to fight heavyweights versus heavyweights across the sex category, only ever within. So the point I'm trying to make is that categories exist 
to allow for maximal inclusion to occur. And once we have recognized that category, then we create boundaries around it that we absolutely must respect. So the question is, do we need a category for a specific sport? There's one of two answers, no or yes. Right? If your answer is yes, then your simple question is why? And the f answer is that there's a presumption of advantage. Now in the case of male physiology, it's not presumption, it's knowledge of advantage, so we can get rid of that word. If you're the IOC, then you think maybe presumption of advantage shouldn't exist. This statement proudly brought to you by the latest document from the International Olympic Committee. No athlete should be precluded on the basis that there should be no presumption of advantage. That is completely contrary to everything we know about biology. Even with the argument that if you lower the testosterone, you can reduce it, this, there should still be a presumption or a knowledge that male advantage persists. If you go back to the yeses, then the next question is, can we identify who belongs in it? Is membership of that category possible to identify? If that's true, then the converse is true as well. We should be able to identify who does not belong in that category. And then the final thing that needs to be assessed is can we create an appropriate boundary around it? And the answers to all those questions is in the case of male female is yes, of course we can. We can do that. We know we have enough evidence. And once we create a boundary, then of course we have to protect that boundary. And that boundary protection means that a person's claim to membership of that category, in other words, my claim to cross that boundary and be part of that category cannot be accepted if the very thing the category is meant to exclude is still present. And that, that's exactly what it is. It's a claim. So when, when an athlete says, I belong in that category, if that athlete weighed, okay, kilograms, 95 kilograms, let's call it 200 pounds, says, I want to be a middleweight athlete, that claim should be rejected because it violates the purpose of a middleweight category. In the same way that when a biological male makes a claim, unsubstantiated by any evidence other than a belief in gender identity that I belong in that category, we have to reject that claim because it invalidates the very existence of the category and the whole purpose of that boundary. So that's the fundamental issue that now needs to be addressed in women's sport. The, the way that that is then challenged even if it's accepted, is that there's this overlap. And again, you, I've shown you this graph before. You know that there's an overlap. Now, this overlap, just as an aside, th this has been offered. It's, this is a classic bimodal distribution. If you pretended that this was one line, you'd see two peaks, minimum, maximum, and so on. That is often put forward as an argument against the sex binary. People say, look, height, mass, strength, speed, These are, this is a spectrum. This is not a binary thing because there's overlap, right? So that, that bimodal distribution is often put forward as an argument against the sex binary. The thing about it is it's disingenuous because this pattern is exactly what you'd expect from a binary distribution of two populations. Like, it's exactly it. For example, and this is a great hat, hat tip to Emma, this purple line could be the size of rabbits, and this yellow line could be the size or the weight of dogs, and that's exactly what you'd get. But if you looked at that, you would not, in fact, and I quote from Emma, you would not be mapping a rap rabbit dog spectrum. <laughs> I don't know. So a tiny dog is not a rabbit. You're not mapping a dogget. I don't know whether Emma made that. She can tell us in the Q&A. No. Emma, did you make this picture or did you find it or how did you come? But anyway, I saw this on Twitter and it was too, I, I try to use it every time I can. So that's, so anyway, that deals with the argument about the sex binary. The point I'm trying to make is that that bimodal distribution of performance is exactly confirmation that sex is binary. It's not disproving it, it's actually proving it. However, if we continue that argument and we apply it now to the argument against sport, the way that it has often been framed is, well, look at testosterone. Testosterone levels overlap. Yesterday in her presentation, Carol showed you a uh, image of a sh an article which I think was from the New York Times. Is that the one you showed? Caucasus, and I forget the second name. Yes. That, this is an argument that's gained quite a lot of momentum, is that because testosterone levels overlap between females and males, so you can see the females here, this is a frequency histogram, total testosterone on the x-axis, and because some of the females are in the male range and some of the males are in the female range, 
This disproves that testosterone is all that important for sports performance, along with, and again highlights it from that CCS document, is a statement that there is no evidence that testosterone levels in females is predictive or associated with performance. Both of these are false arguments. Both of these are part of testosterone denialism, if you want to call it that, for a couple of reasons. The first one is, so this, sorry, let me zoom in. There's no clear scientific evidence that high levels of naturally produced testosterone is predictive of athletic performance among, in, in their case, cis, cis woman. woman. Um, there is no reason to think that that would ever have been the case. This is a straw man. It was, a, it was set up to try and refute the biological realities of sex, and I want to explain that to you in a moment. But before we do that, let's come back to the other graph and explain why that one's flawed. It's flawed for a couple of reasons. It's, most of that data come from a paper by Songson et al., in, in which they tested the hormone, the testosterone levels of a variety of different uh, sports, athletes in a variety of different sports. The problem is they had no control over doping. They had no knowledge over which of those cases were DSD cases. They had no control over the timing of the measure, and we know that there are fluctuations. And they also didn't use the gold standard measurement for how you assess testosterone. Now, just very briefly with respect to doping, when males use testosterone and dope, one of the consequences is that their bodies shut off natural production. And so a male athlete would dope during a period prior to competition and then stop long enough that the drug leaves the system by the time they compete. So they get the training benefits of extra male hormones, but they don't test positive at the time. The problem is at the time they're tested, their body's in that suppressed stage where it's no longer producing any of its own. And so that's why they might end up here. When females dope, of course, the opposite happens, although that's doping offenses, so you should be able to filter that. The DSD cases, you know enough about those. There have been probably half a dozen to a dozen in the last decade whose testosterone levels are naturally elevated, naturally normally in typical male ranges, yet they're classified in women, as women in these competitions. And then the timing of the measure, depending on whether you measure the testosterone just before or just after, high-intensity competition, particularly endurance athletes, can affect that testosterone quite significantly. The biological reality is that in healthy populations, there is no overlap between the upper level of testosterone in women and the lower level of testosterone in, in, in men. And so this is, a, this is a, a red herring graph, almost, that has been used to try and argue against testosterone, which in itself is a red herring or a straw man argument for the following reasons. And this is an important principle to try and understand, is when we look at how a variable x on the, y, uh, on, the, on the x axis predicts performance, we often find relationships in a large population. So for example, basketball performance, the highest level you play at, is a function of your height across the whole population in the same way that your VO2 max, which is effectively the size of your cardiovascular engine, is a predictor of your performance level in marathon running, Tour de France cycling, long distance swimming, etc. But when we take this population and we subdivide it into elite athletes and everyone else, in other words, we slice off the top, the highest performing group of these athletes, and we look at them, what we tend to find, sorry, is that that relationship no longer exists. And the reason it doesn't exist is fairly obvious. It's because everyone in that group already has it. And the moment everyone's already got the ticket, then it's actually no longer the differentiator. Now, all of a sudden, because sports performance is so complex and multifactorial, all the other things start to matter. Now running economy, efficiency, biomechanics, psychological factors, etc., start to play, uh, play an important role. And the best performing athlete might not necessarily be the one with the highest VO2 max. In the same way that the best performing NBA player is not the tallest one. Because everyone he's playing against is also tall. And so in a narrow elite population, there should never have been an expectation that testosterone levels would be related to performance. And so that was a straw man that was set up by the likes of Caucasus, etc., to try and argue against testosterone and biological reality. It, what ra actually matters, and the way that it should have been framed, is that when everyone already has the thing, then it doesn't matter as much. And what is the thing? Now, for a long time, sport wanted the thing to be the level of testosterone in the body. And that's why the solution in 2019 and before that 2015, the thing was let's lower the testosterone and everything will be fine. But that wasn't the thing, you see. The thing, that w the thing was being male. <laughs> that was the thing. <laughs> and so when you look at the world's population, what you end up getting is two distinct populations. 
you get a female population that is an androgenized, let's, let's call that made male. That's literally what it means. Andro meaning male, gen, genesis, created, right? So a female population that has a performance level and a male population that has a performance level. And the difference between them is the biological sex and all the things that brings with it. Now we know, and you've seen these, is that the best performing females are better than most. This is obviously, there's a lot more males below that line. But the best performing females are, are good. They really are comparable. But the best performing males are, depending on what you're measuring, 10 to 50% better than the best performing females. And so in the end, you have this concept where you've got two distinct populations, which you can see here, that differ with respect to all the things that being biologically male. Now, testosterone is uh, inarguably the most important one of those, but it might not be the only one. And we'll discuss in a bit a little bit of evidence for, for that. So we've got two populations. There's overlap in performance because it's multifactorial, but the differences are created between the populations. So anyone who says no evidence that testosterone plays a role in performance, yeah, well, that's because you're asking it within men and within women. You should be asking it between them. And then it's so obvious. It's so obviously one of the differentiators. And there is then no overlap at all. Unless you go back to what Sharon had to encounter in her career, what Linda fought in her time as an athlete and coach. And that's the effect of doping on women. And it's really interesting. That, so that picture there, the oldest woman's world record is the 800-meter world record. It's set in 1983, 153.28, I think it was. That's Jamila kratos Vilova, who also had the second fastest 400 performance ever. Does I have that right, Linda? Sorry? Second fastest 400 ever, yeah. just behind Koch, and then the 800 record, which still stands to this day. So does the, so does the 400. They both do. And, that, and that, that, that's an argument. I mean, and, and you... Listen, I'm not going to tell you, you, you experienced it, you know this, right? You, you'll know why this happened. And so if you come back to this, I just want to make the point that what you're seeing there is an abnormal performance where the normal distribution is skewed by something artificial doping. So what doping did was it took good athletes, but not the best, and it made them better than the best. So Sharon's friend, who she mentioned yesterday, who came fourth, was beaten by three athletes who weren't the best but they had such a large boost as a consequence of doping that they were able to get ahead of the best without the doping. Now, that's, that's an important point because when you apply the same argument to, say, a mediocre male, that mediocre male will dope and will still not be better than the best female. And it's crazy that we have to bring this up because the argument always comes up, and, and fortunately I see it less and less frequently, is if trans women had an advantage, why don't they win everything? Well, it's because they started in the middle. That's why. And you know, the first time I saw this argument come up by a sports organization, and they were almost forced to play this hand, was in the, in the submissions to the Court of Arbitration for Sports in the Casta Semenya case. Semenya's legal team made the same case. They said if Semenya's got male advantage, why isn't she running as fast as the males? And to their credit, the World Athletics legal team said, because Casta Semenya's mediocre. <laughs> and I was, I, was, I was amazed, because Everyone had like tap danced around that issue. And look, she's not mediocre. Semenya's not mediocre. She's still better than most males. But comparatively, yes, that's true, actually. So that male advantage, in the same way that if, that, if that's me on my bicycle with a 150-watt motor, I'm still not beating Jonas Vinegar in the Tour de France. Because, and this is the key point, advantage is not assessed across two populations. It's assessed within a person along the line. So in other words, did I get better? Did I move to the right on this particular line as I got faster, as my performance improved? My pre versus my post. That's how you assess advantage. You don't ask whether a person's better because they beat or lose to someone else. It's a ridiculous argument. And I'm glad to see that that one at least has started to fade away. But you'll still see it. You'll still see it made. Is that isn't, there can't be an advantage because if there were, then they'd be winning races. And in fact, I think we'll get to some case studies in a moment that I think prove that. So, right, let's continue now. So all of that was going on in about 2020, 2021. That was the early days of scientific debate, discourse, tensions, disputes, right? Then in 2021 and 2022, I think if I had to describe it as anything, it would, be, it would almost be the harvest. Because, and I'll show you in a moment, 
the, the biology that I've just explained to you made certain predictions. It was like putting seeds in the ground and then you just wait and see. And the fact that the sports organizations didn't act on that biology meant that they were watering the seeds. They were just waiting for sprouts. And that's what we started to see in 2021 and 2022. We started to get the case studies that proved the theory. And we saw it for the first time in the Tokyo Olympic Games. And then we saw it uh, a little bit later on in 2022 when we had a number of different athletes. And, and, and sports federations were at this point recognizing, I think, the biological concepts. And so, for example, in 2022, we had uh, World Aquatics announce its policy. We had other case studies, again, predictions that were made by the biology were now basically coming true. Uh, hypotheses were being verified, as it were. This will move along eventually. This uh, click has been going to have an overuse injury in my thumb by the time I'm finished here. We had, we had the case, and when, when I was introduced earlier, you heard the story of Leah Thomas in the NCAA swimming. That was at the beginning of that year. Uh, we then had Emily Bridges and the controversy in English cycling at the same time. This will eventually go. Maybe it's the batteries. Switch it off and on again. And then, of course, we had the first of these conferences. And that was... And so that was in Vegas, and we all met and discussed, and, and we didn't have the data yet. But I wanted to share with you a little bit of the data at this point. So before we get into that, let's build the argument. And it has been strange for me to see that people haven't been able to understand these concepts until they literally see them come to fruition. Because you could have predicted everything I'm about to show you, but no one was reacting to it in theory. They needed to see it happen before they reacted. It was a reactive instead of a proactive approach. So this is, this is very much like the graph I showed you earlier that World Rugby produced, except it's more comprehensive by Emma. And it shows you from a range of different studies, the initial bit here in blue to the right of this line are the male advantages over females. And then the question is, how much do they change when the testosterone levels are suppressed? And you'll see that almost without exception, the purple bar is considerably smaller than the blue, which is an indication that there's residual advantage. Emma and Tommy produced a paper, and then Joanna Harper produced a paper that concluded very much the same thing, and then that, that was there was no evidence that testosterone suppression removed male biology, and therefore, by suggestion, male performance. So this is a, an important graph, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time trying to go through it with you. It's, it's one of the graphs that Emma made to explain this. And what it shows you is the relative performance in whichever task it happens to be, so, for instance, in some of these, it's lean body mass. In some of these, it's grip strength. In some of these, it's leg extension strength. So those are the studies that you're looking at on the x-axis. And what Emma has done is she's made the trans woman before testosterone suppression equal to 1. So that's your sort of reference point. So that orange line is the trans woman before suppression. Above it, you can see here's a line for non-trans women because these studies often have control groups which are biological male, who are not about to undergo testosterone suppression. So that's an important point because a lot of the criticism that was leveled at Emma and Tommy Lindbergh in this paper was that they were making comparisons between males and trans women as if that wasn't actually valid. I mean, it's, but nevertheless, so Emma said, well, all right, fine, let's actually, let's actually treat, for the sake of argument, trans women as a subcategory of biological male. There's no reason to do that biologically that is known, but that's what was being done in this particular instance. And what you're then looking at in these orange arrows is how much performance or lean muscle mass or male biology, whatever you want to call it, the biological element in question, dropped as a consequence of testosterone suppression. And what you will see is that that drop, on average across all these studies, was about 4%. Now the key comparison is what does that look like compared to the females against which those should now be compared afterwards, right, in this frame of reference. And the answer is, shown here by the light blue line at the bottom, is about 26% of that advantage remains. So where in the beginning, the difference between trans women, this cohort of biological males, and females was 30%, what is left after testosterone suppression is about 26%. So that's almost 90% of the original difference. And these were all the studies. Since then, there have been a couple others. Roberts came out. There was a study that Emma alluded to over the 14-year period. But this, this was the data set that World Rugby saw. This is the data set that I'm sure World Aquatics has looked at, that World Athletics has looked at, uh, 
the UCI ignored for a long time. And eventually, I think, have recognized that this difference, the space between this red line and this blue line, is the residual male advantage. This is the bit that John wants to, John argued or explained to you, the IC wants to shift across to one of all the other different advantages, right? So that's the point. The small point of male advantage is removed. Now, back to this. Remember that if this is what performance looks like between women and men, and we have this example of a graph, and we have this physiological gap, then any blue dot who retains even half, even 10% of the male advantage that exists in this physiological gap is going to parlay that retention of advantage into a ranking improvement into women's sport. So you could set a scientific hypothesis in 2019, 2020, 2021. This stuff was known then. Male biological differences are real, yes. Performance advantages are the result of this reality, yes. Unless those differences are removed entirely, the leftover advantage will be evident in a significant improvement of ranking when someone enters the women's care. That was the obvious scientific hypothesis. What we had at the time, and even more in hindsight, was a really elegant scientific hypothesis, and then you just had to sit back and wait for it to see if it was true. The counter is, if you want to adopt like a null hypothesis way of scientific thinking, is that male advantage is removed and therefore trans women in women's sports would not change ranking. That's what Jonah Harper tried to pitch to the IOC with her study of eight, the N equals eight. It was your website, n equals eight.com. Yeah. You can go and look at that there. I'm not going to labor that point. But that was the, that's the counter argument, right? So now you've got, in effect, what's been set up as a pretty large experiment. And you say, all right, let's see what happens. And sure enough, cases started to emerge that allow us to test this hypothesis. And the first of those was Laurel Hubbard. Now, who, who was it who mentioned, was it Ro, Rowena Edge yesterday? You, you shared Laurel's story more. Okay, so I'm not going to go into the background and the context. I'm going to give you the data a little bit here. When Laurel Hubbard came back as a 40-year-old weightlifter and set a world record, the winning margin and the difference between first and second was 77%. The orange bars on this graph show you some comparisons for the open category, the women's 35, the men's, uh, and the, women's, uh, the men's 35 category. That's the typical difference, and that was Hubbard. So that's clearly an outlier. So much of an outlier that in actual fact, when you look in this next graph, I'll just try and explain it to you as we go through it, eventually. There we go. Right, this is the combined total lift of all the lifters in the competition over a period of time. The yellow bars are men's lifts. The orange squares and diamonds are women. The squares is the men's 35 category. The diamonds, men's 40. Squares, orange squares is women's 35. Diamonds is women's 40. And so what you can see here in, in this one graph is a sex difference between gold and orange. That's male, female. And also an age difference between squares and diamonds. And you're looking at the worst lifter here and the best lifter over on the right-hand side. And notice that there is no overlap between the weakest male men's lifter, the, this diamond, and the strongest women's lifter in either of the age categories, except for Laurel Hubbard, the blue. So that performance, that performance to break that record was so good that it was in the middle of the male range. Now, well... The scientific hypothesis tells you why. is because that's, like, is, if, if, I can't, how else do you explain that other than hypothesis confirmed? Is that this is a case of an athlete who has carried through residual advantage, even after testosterone suppression for a period of time, to produce a performance that is so dominant that it's 77% better than everyone else's, which is almost an order of magnitude better than the average. And it's so good then that it allowed that performance to feature in the middle of the male range and allow an athlete to go to the Olympic Games as a 40-something-year-old in a sport that is dominated by 20-something-year-olds where we know peak strength. And you can see in the graph what the effect of age on performance is. So, case, case study one. Case study two came from swimming. And it was really interesting to follow this and watch it develop. And it was the, obviously the example of Leah Thomas. Now, there's a scientific paper on this. It was published earlier this year by Snedeker et al. Uh, sorry, uh, Senefelt et al. It's 2023. And these, these charts and tables are going to come from that. So first of all, 
what this, got, this chart plots is the different events that Thomas ended up competing in. And this was the times and the performances, the times and the rankings as Will Thomas in the men's category and then Leah Thomas in the women's category. And I want to highlight the key points and we, we, we test our hypothesis once again. So these were the rankings pre, prior to conversion in men's sport, 550, 65th, and 32nd. The change in performance that was measured when you compare the times here to the times down below was in the range of, well, it varied between almost nothing and about 7 odd percent. Now we know, again, I've shown you the data on this, that the typical male-female difference in swimming events is between 10 and 12 percent, call it. And so when you look at the magnitude of these performance reductions, they are less than the typical performance differences between male and female, and so therefore your hypothesis would be the ranking will improve, and sure enough, that's exactly what happens. So the rankings go up all the way to, in one instance, first. When Senefelt et al. looked at this and they had a control group, what they found was this is the ranking of all the swimmers who were ranked between 45th and 85th in a given year, right? And Thomas's result is shown here in the blue triangle. And so this is the year that Thomas was ranked 65th. That's that data point here, right? So that's 65th in the 200-meter event. And then the year later, well, having not competed that year, two years after that, goes all the way to the top. Obviously, people's rankings change over time. It's possible that you can go from being 150th or whatever it is to top. But look at the bo these boxes here tell you what is a typical improvement. And so you can see the outlier. And so this is another example of a hypothesis that is confirmed. So the performance advantages that are, the, sorry, the biological advantages that are attained parlay into a performance benefit that is manifest as an increase in ranking. And then the last one is a cyclist. This is one of the data points from the, well, it's the data point from the, the research study on Jana Harper. This is a tweet, note the date, this was the 27th of February, it was at the same time here that the controversy was happening around participation of Emily Bridges in the women's cycling events in the UK. I think they were looking to qualify, or she was looking to qualify for the Commonwealth Games at that point, and you remember that the women of UK cycling protested and effectively stopped that from happening. In that same period, Bridges was riding in a team... <laughs> In that, same, in that same period, this photographs a podium ceremony where Bridges was riding and winning a men's team time trial. And so it was literally shifting from men's to women's sports within a few weeks. Uh, and so th anyway, that in itself was telling. But the data, the data that subsequently came out is really interesting. So I wanted to just take you through a little bit of that. These are the VO2 changes. So VO2 is a, it's a marker of cardiovascular performance. And what you're looking at here, the orange line is VO2 max. And... There are a couple of landmarks here along this x-axis, which is the timeline. <clears throat> this red line is the moment at which the testosterone suppression begins. And what you will discover here is that from a period of three months post all the way to 12 months post, there's actually no effect of lower testosterone on VO2 max. That said, the VO2 max prior to a concussion, which happened eight months before the testosterone suppression, was considerably higher. And so there was this uh, drop the highest point in this one-year period is lower than this, this point. But you must also just notice the training volumes. This is the hours of cycling per week. The, the training volume had been suppressed, and we'll see some interesting findings when you actually look at the performance metrics. This is power output. The, the blue line shows three minutes power output. The orange line is the 12 minutes, and the gray line is critical power. These are all metrics that cyclists would be very familiar with as tests for how good your performance is going to be. And again, you see the, 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 the moment at which the gender-affirming hormone treatment begins, so the testosterone level we assume to be, we don't know it because that wasn't, I don't think, shown, but we assume is lower in this period. So a couple of things is that 12 months after the hormone suppression, the, the three-minute power, because Bridges is a track cyclist, so that's really the one that matters the most for, for Bridges, is 5.8 watts a kilogram. That's 5% higher than at the start of the period of hormone transition. So... Clearly, you can get better while your testosterone is suppressed. That said, it is 12% lower than the peak, which was before concussion, but the training volumes over the period of the testing were 27% lower than at peak. So it becomes quite difficult to interpret this because the, the training is not necessarily staying the same either, and 
unless you believe training has no bearing on performance, that kind of seems important. Just to make the point, though, the typical male-female gaps, this was a study that was published by Valenzuela in 2022. They've got literally hundreds of thousands of data points from cyclists in elite men's and women's competition. So those are the differences in power. Now, one of the things that has already come up is that people say, well, the performance difference between men and women in cycling is 10 to 12 percent, and that's true. But that performance difference is the outcome of a power difference that's actually about 20 percent. And I've already heard it said that Bridges lost 12% of her power output, and therefore we should allow this because that's complete loss. It's actually not. The difference creating the 12% is 20% because that's how power and speed work in a relationship with one another. So the losses in Emily Bridges versus all-time peak are 12, 15, and 16%, which means that even there, there is retention of male advantage with less training. And then the final one, just to show you the less training, even most, most obviously of all, is lower body strength with, uh, over the period. And what you'll notice here is that the counter movement jump is actually higher at any point during the period of testosterone suppression, much higher than it was even before. And that coincides with a period of intensive resistance training. And so as there was a major focus on training, the thing that you would expect to improve as a consequence of training improved. And so the net result of this, if you wanted to be I guess a little bit uncharitable is that this study has shown that performance changes as training changes. <laughs> so the IRC have contributed significantly to exercise physiology in that respect. I do, I do, I do want to just recognize that these studies would be really difficult to do, but they're so poorly planned and conceived that they're almost destined to look like this, and that's the problem. We, we invited research as part of the World Rugby proposal, and we, we didn't get a single proposal that would stood up to any level of scientific scrutiny. So it's not that surprising that we're in this situation. So point is, Bridges, it's confounded significantly by changes in, cha changes in training. One of the points I'd make is that it does show that if you change your training, you can increase performance, muscle strength, power output, even while testosterone is suppressed. People argue that that wouldn't be the case, but it obviously is. There's no evidence that any elements of performance is removed, and hence the indication is still retention of advantage. So the case study, again, doesn't change the, the, the physiological reality at the time. So where does all that leave us? That's just a couple of case studies. You can list, there are now dozens of them. It's really actually remarkable how many examples there are of athletes. Some of them don't have the data. For instance, it would be really interesting to analyze Killip's performances. Uh, before versus after. Don't know that there's data on that. I think that if I, if I was asked to look into it now, I would be mining Strava data. I think that would be probably one of the most powerful ways to do it. But then you've got to know when the medical interventions happen. So these things are difficult, and I don't know that they're going to come at any stage in, in the near future, particularly. So where are we now? Right, so that's, that, that brings us to 2023. And obviously World Athletics and the UCI have now also come on with policies that try to protect the female category, imperfect as they are. As I mentioned to you, World Rugby has to next assess its policy. I think what's, what, what, and I'm trying to conclude now at this point, is when those sports have made the, the decisions, whether it's World Athletics earlier this year or the UCI, they have recognized the principle of, rec of hearing everyone. You know, Riley yesterday when she introduced this conference spoke about what about us. I think one of the most significant changes from my perspective is that that voice has now been heard. Definitely wasn't being heard prior to about 2020. And so that's, that's the biggest change. And I think the athletics bodies, swimming, have started to listen because they, well, not so much they started to listen as they couldn't ignore any longer. That's more reality there. The other thing that's happened is that they have recognized that you can't balance this. And you know, for instance, when Sebastian Coe um, announced that policy, he used similar language as you can't balance these imperatives. And so there are still other sports. Just this morning, incidentally, a paper came out. Um, one of the co-authors was from UK Fencing. You'll probably see it in the next while. It's been shared a little bit on Twitter. And it very systematically goes through what makes a good fencer? What is the typical difference between male and female fencers? How does performance look? What does testosterone suppression do therefore? And it's a very solid argument. So I would anticipate that fencing will soon have a policy. Maybe just UK Fencing. Maybe Thomas Bach was a fencer. Maybe that's what it'll take for the IOC to pay attention. Who knows? I doubt it. But, the, but I guess the message that I want to put out there now at this point is 
in 2019, there were, I think there was still a case to be made that there was a, a little bit of openness around the science. There was a dispute. There was a debate. That debate now seems to me, it's never, it's, science is never fully settled and done. You're never, you're never done. It's never 100%. So there's obviously some things that have to be explored in the future. But the bottom line is this, and this is for any sports um, decision makers that are potentially watching this online, is it's time that you made a choice. That's what it is. And as long as you stand behind that choice, at least that's honest. Sports will continue potentially to make choices that prioritize inclusion over, well, of one group over the inclusion of women. That will happen, I've got no doubt, because it's just decisions that people make. But it's fundamentally nowadays it's a choice. It's not a dilemma, it's a choice. And so you have to make that choice. That's the, that's the point at this, at this time. What about the world rugby process? We'll get to that very shortly. But what we know is this. We know that there's male-female differences. We know that they're physiological, functional, and performance. So that's real. We know, and this is a figure from a paper that Emma is uh, the senior author on, Tommy Lindbergh, I'm also on it. We've managed to finally persuade, I think it's about 20-odd sports scientists, to write a paper that will rebut and reject this IOC's notion of science with this respect. And that, that will be submitted and I hope published really soon. This is a figure from that particular paper. It exists because of biology, and this is a summary of all those biological differences. And then, of course, you've seen this. We know that it outlasts testosterone. So what was a scientific dispute in 2019 is now a question of choice. The science is no longer going to be the, the thing that is going to be debated. You, we know enough to make a decision at this point. No one should be paralyzed by a lack of knowledge. We should be empowered by what we do know and then make decisions and then live with the consequences of those decisions. That's, that's the message, I think, for sports. As for the World Rugby, we meet later this year again in October to discuss it. What remains for us to consider? A couple things that are on the table. Conceptually, women's sport has to exist, it has to be protected, and those boundaries around it have to be protected. So our answer to the questions I put to you earlier remains yes. We know we can identify who belongs, we can identify who doesn't belong, and therefore we respect and create a boundary around it. The question remains around whether we go open versus male. That was discussed in 2020, incidentally. Uh, John, again, had, pre had presented that to the group, this idea that we can have an open category and then a closed category for female. In the end, we've stayed with men's and women's. I think it needs to be put back on the table as to whether we go for open and women's. But that's, that's a conceptual argument that needs to be had. The second thing is scientifically. There's a few questions here. One of the things that I think will emerge more and more in the next few years is what is the effect of the testosterone suppression pre-puberty on, on sporting implications? The World Rugby Guideline was also argued as anything post-puberty. It was similar to FINA's, uh, or World Aquatics rather, sorry, where they said that if you suppress after puberty, then no eligibility into women's sports similar to the UCIs. And I think sports are going to have to start confronting that question, is whether the distinction should be irrespective of when testosterone suppression happens. There was one paper came out um, recently called Transgender Girls at All, Adult Height is Unaffected by the basically... Similar the to the UCIs. UCIs. And I think sports are going to have to so confront that. not in and of itself enough to talk about sports performance, but it is maybe the first evidence that and you're going to hear tomorrow, incidentally. Where's Mara and Greg? Mara's there. Greg's somewhere. Yeah. There you are. They're going to present to you a little bit of data that shows that those performance differences that I've shared with you, graphs of in adults, those things exist before puberty happens. And so we frame this very much as puberty is the watershed beyond which that, that may need to be looked at. One of the reasons that may need to be looked at, incidentally, is practical, because I think there are issues. Yesterday it was raised as a question. At the moment, I don't know how any of the sports with these policies are able to actually identify and enforce either a testosterone reduction policy or an eligibility, uh, eligibility policy in terms of the, the, the policies of the UCI and athletics. I mean, how are they going to do it? I, don't, I honestly don't know what they will do. And if you allow cases in and exemptions for people who've suppressed before puberty, your, your challenge becomes even more complex because now you not only have to measure the levels now, you've got to actually understand when the puberty happened and when the intervention happened relative to that. And it's one of those cases where you, you're trying to make allowances and every allowance you make adds exponentially to the challenge. And 
implementation-wise, I'm not sure how sports are going to deal with this. So that needs to be assessed. And the other thing is that, can you imagine combat sports, boxing, mixed martial arts, where you have a category for middleweights and you don't have a weigh-in? Like, I, I, I can't see how it's tenable that you can have a category and have no mechanism by which to ensure that the category at compliance exists. And so I think that there is going to have to be discussion around screening. I think Colin is speaking on that tomorrow. Uh, again, imagine combat sports without screening. That's what, that's what women's sport would look like without some kind of screen. And Linda, I think, spoke a little bit about it yesterday. Colin will pick it up tomorrow. But those are things that World Rugby will have to discuss when we meet. But one thing that I will say is the, is the following, is that none of the progress of the last year, and I'm talking now the big three sports, because we had aquatics, we had track and field, and then we had cycling come in, let alone the last four, is the result of evolving science. The science seems to me to be actually quite stuck. It's not going to move very quickly. But what has changed to allow those policies to change is the recognition of the science. It's not the existence of the science. So the same stuff is on the table today as was on the table in 2019. It's just that it is now more attention has been drawn to it, and that's, that's you. And so I would love to stand and say, oh, you know, we as scientists have really helped turn, to help this thing turn the corner. We haven't at all. It's the advocacy, and it's the voice of the woman, and it's the pressure that you've applied to those sports federations and organizations. That's what's changed it. And that's why, if I am pleased, pleased to be invited back here, Kim, and to not talk about this, but instead, <laughs> instead to talk about actual issues in women's sport, concussion and injuries and performance and, like, the real stuff, <laughs> when, we can, when we can have stimulating, cool conversations about how amazing physiology is at the elite level performance. That's what I'd love to come back to and talk about. That's going to mean that you need to put more pressure on those sports so that we can deal with this issue and then get on to the fun stuff. Thank you. Thank you. So we'll have a few minutes for Q&A. Can you try to pull Emma back up if she's on? So we'll have a few minutes for Q&A and then we'll break for lunch.